In the early 90s, that's a quarter of a century ago, I was in Warsaw. I was in Warsaw on a promotional tour for a book on solidarity that I had just published, titled Poland Challenges a, Divi a Divided World. A friend recommended that I seek a conversation with Professor Janusz Kuczynski, the head of the philosophy department at the University of Warsaw. Professor Kuczynski agreed to see me. We met in his office. As we talked, our thoughts tumbled over one another. The interview became searching and exciting. One theme in particular stood out, co-evolution. What it meant beguiled us. What it might or could mean in its implications seemed both daunting and very timely. What any good conversation will do for you, I came away with more questions and more things to explore and understand. Co-evolution, the word and the concept would come back to me again and again. It became a critical element, or better said, a catalyzing element that highlighted the rising tide of inquiry into just what does it mean that we are part of nature. More and more scholars, albeit still a small number, we're making the point that humanity must now thoroughly re-examine its connection to nature and with nature. The growing intellectual ferment mirrored the growing threat of environmental disruption, poisoning, and ecological breakdown worldwide. I came away from the interview with Professor Kuczynski thinking that co-evolution, whatever it really or fully means, just might offer a way to think positively and creatively about our human relation to nature and our relation to one another, consequently, as well. As I left his office, Janusz told me about plans for holding worldwide congresses of philosophers committed to universal dialogue. He invited me to join. I didn't know it then, but this invitation and my subsequent participation in the many congresses of the International Society for Universal Dialogue have become for me an intellectually liberating and joyful experience. Co-evolution, what might it mean? What is the context in which it has meaning? I will unfold the argument as best as I can in the next few minutes. Granted, I argued with myself, that we humans have erred, and erred grievously in misreading our relationship to nature, falsely assuming that we are not only separate from, not only higher than, but also superior to nature. We have approached nature in an anthropocentric spirit, a kind of cosmic insouciance or even worse, a willful arrogance. We've done so with such persistent enthusiasm that we may be contriving our own extinction or coming close to having already contrived it. Though that is still denied by some, 
in spite of incontestable scientific findings, most of us now acknowledge our mistake. Among several possible responses to this, two currently stand out. They provide a context in which to take up a new response, co-evolution. One response has been to accept what has happened and in a chastened mood, realize that being part of nature, we must embrace nature. We must go with the flow of things. Nature has its own ways. There is a lot of science and a lot of scholarship out there in discipline after discipline that should convince us that we are part of inexorable forces and inevitable trends from past to future. We must learn to adapt and accept. An opposite response is to shrug our shoulders, remind ourselves that we are, after all, beings with, the beings endowed with reason. With the rational part of our nature, we can and must deal more knowledgeably with nature to alter it where it should be altered and strive to avert our ruin. Each of these responses has some sense, additionally, makes some sense additionally, but as such, they need work. Both reveal the continued influence of the old mechanistic paradigm of the early moderns. Its touting of nature as composed of insular, separate atoms that exhibit a linear cause and effect motion of things. This has led to frameworks of understanding in the disciplines that feature scenarios of a deterministic world. On top of that, we are pushed this way and that by ever more intensive and manipulated technologies. For example, artificial intelligence is currently a looming example. To say nothing, of course, of the ever lurking atomic bomb that sword of Damocles hanging over our heads, seemingly by a thread. This second response seems to continue the view of nature laid down by the old paradigm, but with a way out. The argument is, yes, let's accept that by the nature of our bodies, we are driven. But in our minds, we can discover and apply ways to elude and transcend the deterministic world of our bodies. We are made of higher stuff, deeper stuff, in and through our heads. We can school ourselves to be free. I see Kant that way. Armed with renewed energy and insight into the ways of reason, he set out to rescue humankind from the deterministic implications of the science fashioned by the early moderns. I also see Nietzsche that way, with his starkly self-possessed and very lonely Übermensch. His is a refusal to bow down to what he agrees are the coils of nature that the science of the day conjures up for us. I also see existentialism that way to a considerable degree, the heir of Nietzsche. A noble attempt in the mind and the will to rise through and beyond what is regarded as the cloying claustrophobia of nature. An alluring temptation to retrieve our nature, to form a new nature, free from what is poignantly dismissed as the absurdity, the absurdity of everyday life. Now, much of these two responses evokes a suspicion of anthropocentrism. They both continue in the mode of seeing the world in terms of discrete, separate beings. Thus, it comes as no surprise that neither of these two postures is or can be truly a home for dialogue. 
The practitioners of each response can and should look carefully at the foundations for a new paradigm forged by the scientific revolution started by Einstein and his heirs. These heirs include the explorers of quantum physics, the strong work of feminist scholars and philosophers, and diligent and fascinating investigations of ecological, by ecological philosophers and scientists. A much different view and understanding of nature emerges from their work. It is in the context and frameworks their work provides that co-evolution comes to the fore. The new view of nature forefronts relationship, not separation. It attributes animation to natural bodies, holding that all things are in the active voice. This being so, the fields of thinking and action are seen now as things in deep and compelling interaction with one another. Co-evolution fits in here naturally. To be part of nature makes way more sense in the context of this new paradigm than it could ever have in the old paradigm. What that prefix co has in mind for us is intriguing. Yet more than intriguing, it is exceedingly relevant and timely. Co-evolution posits separability and relational differentiation, not separation. Embedded in relational differentiation, it simultaneously posits active interaction among and between all things. It posits the self-organizing and self-agency powers of nature within each of us, producing neither domination nor submission. It invites back and forth communication. Indeed, it pushes us towards dialogue. The central key in the progression of thought here is how this, our human evolutionary interface with nature, leads us, challenges us, to act on the fact of our interactive destiny. That fact leads directly to dialogue and more dialogue. A co-evolutionary approach to nature rooted in a disposition to dialogue, restores and deepens the capacity for wonder. It likewise provides the basis and context for the artful and creative power of listening, listening to others and listening to nature. It provides the readiness to accord to the other, the reality of that other's being. And it provides the joy in one's own being at being fully acknowledged. We live in the world, not somewhere outside of it, pondering our position. We are together with all things in nature, participants and more and more self-conscious participants in our own evolution. <laughs> the philosopher Gadamer, in a very troubled mood, once exclaimed, conversation is dead. Well, it isn't, but it needs a lot of help. It is dead unless we make a fresh start and elevate dialogue to the realization of its true potential. Dialogue is the fulfillment of the interactive potential of nature. It is through dialogue that we human beings attain a truly operative co-relationship. With full-scale dialogue, we can have some optimism that our technological inventions and breakthroughs are positive, creative, and balanced. 
with respectful dialogue, fully practiced, both among ourselves as human beings and of ourselves with all of nature, we can have some optimism that our human species will have its best chance for survival and for a peaceful and plentiful life. Thank you.